Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm, I'm Matt Auer. I'm the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs, and I want to welcome you to today's Constitution Day lecture. Um, this is actually my seventh year as Dean at, at SPIA, and it's sort of amazing, but each year when I think about this day, it actually is more important that we talk about the Constitution, it seems to me, than the year before. So I love uh, Constitution Day, and I look forward to this event every year. So the Constitution, U.S. Constitution, there are state constitutions. If you were here for last year's talk, you'd know about that. But the U.S. Constitution was signed on September 17, 1787. And official celebrations of the U.S. Constitution actually go back to 1940. But most recently, a federal holiday was declared in 2004 when Senator Robert Byrd presented a bill designating September 17th as the day for citizens to remember and honor the signing of the U.S. Constitution and to consider the historical and the contemporary importance of that moment for the nation and for the citizenry. There's a nice little article today in the red and black, so you can take a look at that as well. Today's event would not, would not have been possible without the generous support of several organizations, both on and off campus. First, I want to thank the Jack Miller Center for their consistent support of Constitution Day at UGA. Other sponsors are the Provost's Seminar Series on Academic Excellence, the School of Public and International Affairs, and the American Founding Group. The latter is a student and faculty discussion group that's in the Department of Political Science and it's led by Keith Doherty. And in fact, I would like to thank Dr. Doherty for his leadership, his leadership which makes uh, Constitution Day happen every year at UGA, he's in the front row, as well as, and others who are here, Lauren Ledbetter and Wendy Finch for their logistical support, uh, Sarah Causey from the library for leading Constitution on the Quad prior to our program. That was fun, it was heartening to see students getting the right answers to quiz questions about the Constitution. Makes me optimistic about the future. And I also want to thank Jan Levinson Hebbard with the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library for providing the display of historical documents, which are right here and are really cool. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Mary Sarah Builder is the Founders Professor of Law at Boston College, where she teaches in the areas of property, trusts and estates, and American legal and constitutional history. Builder is the author of three books, numerous journal articles, blogs, and op-eds. Her scholarship and expertise have been featured on various TV programs, including on the History Channel and C-SPAN. In 2016, she was awarded the Bancroft Prize in American History and Diplomacy, and the James C. Bradford Prize for her first book, Madison's Hand, revising the Constitutional Convention. Her latest book is Female Genius, Eliza Harriet and George Was Washington at the Dawn of the Constitution. A reviewer of this book writes, quote, Builder is a detective extraordinaire, distinguished by lucid prose and exceptional research. Builder's female genius resurrects an individual who had been lost to us. Eliza Harriet Barron's O'Connor. Builder is persuasive in suggesting that Harriet's presence played a role in shaping the final language of the Constitution, among other lasting impacts. Welcome, Professor Builder. I will now turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much. I'm impressed by the number of people who are here, and um, and I'm hoping that at least some of you are getting extra credit for um, uh, for showing up because you always should always take all opportunities to get um, extra credit. I know that a number of you may have to leave early just at the exciting right in the exciting moments of my speech because you have a class. So I will not take it. Uh, I will not take it personally at all if people have to. Um, 
uh, leave. Well, I'm, I'm just delighted uh, to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Auer, Dr. Darty, the um, University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs, the Political Science Department, and the American Founding Group for inviting me to speak for Constitution Day. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and they were like, oh, you're always gone from school this week of September, which is kind of like the beginning of school. What's that about? And I was like, yeah, well, this Senator Byrd invented this federal holiday, and so every school has to invite a speaker in. And so this is my time of the year that I have to speak a lot. And they were like, well, wouldn't it have been better to be some other time of the year than the beginning of the school year? And I said, yeah, but, but the Constitution didn't get signed then, so that's the date. And they're like, you learn something every day. So the reason we have Constitution Day here is because this is the um, uh, around the t that days, traditionally the week that the Constitution was signed. And I'm delighted to be here today and to share some recent work of mine on the framing generation uh, and the Constitution. And I always believe, begin with Eliza Harriet O'Connor's words, it's the epigraph of my book, and you see it on the slide if you have good eyesight. Uh, the exertions of a female, that is the efforts of a female, should be considered as presenting an example to be imitated and improved on by future candidates for literary fame. And Eliza Harriet believed in the power of the example, the influence that one person had by presenting an example which would inspire others and future generations. And this idea was the theory on which she understood her extraordinary lecturing and female schools. And this theory that people in the past who were not part of the typical story might be imitated and improved on is a lesson I believe is true about our Constitution. Now, so at the outset, let me explain that I have a picture book approach to my slide, so there's multiple images on every slide. Um, I'm always a person who wants to know, like, when's the speaker going to stop talking? So there's about 25 slides. Um, I'm also, uh, early in my life, realized I was happier when no one's looking at me and everyone's looking at the screen. So um, feel, feel free to pay no attention to the, to the speaker here. Uh, when we think about the framing of the Constitution, we tend to think about the event in the way that public art depicts the moment. And the classic images of the framers depict the founding as about the men inside the room. No one's part of the story except the white male delegates. And we see here the two most famous images of the convention, one from the House of Representatives, that's the Christie one on the top, and the second one from um, the National Archives, Barry Faulkner's Constitution, which, which is, if you take art history, is similar to the School of Athens. Uh, Jefferson described them as an assembly of demigods. And indeed, there are no demigoddesses in the assembly. And yet Cleo, who was the muse of history, was a demigoddess. She was the child of Zeus and Mnemosyne. Mnemosyne was the titan of memory. And Cleo's provided inspiration for prominent female artists, firsts like Angelica Kaufman and Artemisia Gentileschi to be admitted to male institutions. And she was the name of my new dog. You see there, Cleo, okay? C-L-I-O. And Cleo reminds us that history creates power by selecting what we remember about the past. And I believe we've misremembered the imaginative space around the framing of the Constitution. And yet it can be hard to see the past. The traditional view of this period appears in this famous painting by Edward Savage, often described as the Washington family. We see Washington on the left with Martha's son holding the tools of power, the globe, and the sword. And we see William Lee, however, on the right. Lee was enslaved by Washington. His valiant right-hand man, the Museum of the American Revolution, now interprets Washington's time at Valley Forge with William Lee. And he traveled throughout the war and remained close to Washington. But he was enslaved. We see Martha on the right with Lee and her daughter holding fans, female power. And we see no one like Oni Judge, the enslaved woman who escaped from the Washingtons and refused to return. 
White men and children, male children, are on the left with power. White women have a certain domestic power. And William Lee is even farther on the periphery. And this project is part of a larger argument I've made about how we think about this period. The words that we use to describe the group in that painting, sometimes founders, sometimes framers, makes them seem like they're the only people who matter. I try not to refer to the founders because this country was not founded in 1787 by a group of elite white men. I don't mind so much framers when used carefully to talk about those who worked actively on drafting. But I myself like to describe it as a framing generation. And I believe that many people outside of Independence Hall influenced the way in which the 1787 Constitution was drafted and the system of government imagined. And this matters because our Constitution places authority in we, the people. Those words and the iconography of them follow the pattern in colonial royal charters. Where the king's name once was, and you see um, uh, right here, this is King, king Charles who gave those charters. We have the people. And we can see this transition even in the colonial world under charters as early colonial American printed law books emphasized the form of government as the charter of the colony and de-emphasized that it was granted by the king. So who are the people? The Supreme Court's relative turn to a jurisprudence of originalism, a mode of interpretation that insists that the current court is required to interpret according to the meaning of the words that were had 225 years ago, seems to insist that we focus on the group of white men who were in the room. And we do know a lot about them. They had houses, families, descendants, they wrote and printed, and left us lots of written material, which is what history tends to privilege. But in the mid-18th century, the people were not the people inside the room. They included the people outside the room, or what they would have said at the time, without doors. And although the phrase, the people, has a long and complicated intellectual tradition, the concept became very popular with British political reformers in the 1760s. For them, the phrase, the people, became a way to emphasize collective political authority that lay beyond the very few who were permitted to vote. Here we see the influential constitutional historian, Catherine McCauley, in a popular image of her as a Roman woman mourning the death of the liberties of the people. She holds a volume entitled Lex P, Lex Publica, the law of the people. And she addressed her 1775 pamphlet defending American colonists to the people of England, Scotland, and Ireland. She noted specifically, she addressed it to the people who are, quote, unjustly debarred the privilege of election and except by petition and remonstrance have no legal means of opposing the current government. Ironically and importantly, George Washington also used the term the people in this sense, referring to people who are outside of elected sort of classic representation. And he also used the people in a striking different sense in his diary. Here we can see excerpts from his diary just before he left for the Philadelphia Convention. The people, as he put it, were putting up new fences and grubbing new ground. The people here were the nearly 300 enslaved people of color owned and enslaved by Washington and Martha Washington. At the time of his death, in 1719, the estate would have 317 people. And these people, sometimes thought not to be among the we people, are part of the people. And they contribute as much, if not more, to the creation of the United States. Now, the framing generation matters because the Constitution is both a textual instrument and a system of government. The word Constitution was shifting during this period. And as remains true still today in England, the word constitution meant system of government. And the words actually written on the parchment were, quote, the instrument. We see this in an explanation in 1818 that James Madison wrote 
about the purpose of the Federalist essays. He said, the immediate object of the essays was to vindicate the new Constitution to the state of New York, whose ratification of the instrument was doubtful as well as important. The instrument was not the actual Constitution. As late as 1833, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story similarly distinguished between the two concepts. And he said in his commentaries on the Constitution, he would treat the Constitution as it was denominated in the instrument, the piece of paper itself, as a constitution of government, ordained and established by the people of the United States for themselves and their posterity. As the justice noted, the preamble emphasizes that the Constitution is a system of government for the people and posterity. Now, in past several years, scholarship has turned to recover the ways in which the Constitution was created by a group a generation, a framing generation, not just a group of elite white men. And I've written, for example, about four Native Nation representatives, members of the Cherokee and Choctaw tribes, who met with Washington and convention delegates in the summer of 1787 and influenced the language and interpretation of the Constitution. And I've also written about John Adams, who was in England during the convention, and the profound influence of a book of his serialized in the newspaper about the deep structure of American government. And here we see that September 21st, when his first book appeared, when his book appeared on the front page of that newspaper with the preamble of the Constitution in the lower right corner. So who else was part of this generation? Well, turning now to the subject of my most recent book, let me take a constitutional clause, the one relating to the sex and gender of the president. In 1872, Victoria Woodhull ran for president, the first woman to do so. But since then, only men have been elected. And the 28 apparently male pronouns relating to the president might suggest that women were excluded intentionally, or that the framers could not even imagine the possibility of inclusion. But in 1788, Hugh Henry Brackenridge read the Constitution as theoretically open to a female. His essay mocked criticisms of the Constitution. Brackenridge wrote, the first thing that strikes a diligent observer is the want of precaution with respect to the sex of the president. Is it provided that he shall be of the male gender? He said, what shall we think if in the process of time we come to have an old woman at the head of our affairs. What security have he that he is a white man? His views himself on those possibilities are ambiguous, but Breckenridge revealed the Constitution's semantic gender tolerance. Now, for me, the question about how we think about this arose in an entry in George Washington's diary from the summer of 1787, from May of 1787. Washington was waiting in Philadelphia for the convention to start. He'd been at tea at Mary White Morris's house, and then he went with her and other ladies to hear a lady read at College Hall. He later wrote in his diary that the reading had been a charity affair because the lady being reduced in circumstance had recourse to this expedient to obtain a little money. He judged her performance tolerable, which for those Austinites among us, we know is what Mr. Darcy says about Eliza Bennett. And so I judge this a relative success. The lady was Elizabeth Harriet Barons O'Connor, and I'm gonna call her Eliza Harriet because that was the part of her name that was her own. She's been largely unknown, there are only five letters, and so this project was largely based on digital newspaper research. Eliza Harriet had remarkable importance to women's rights, and her belief was that women could reach the college and political forum. Her lectures influenced the Constitution's gender-neutral language, and her academies influenced countless young women in the early republic. Her biography is an inspirational history of women who believed in education as a political right. We have no portrait of Eliza Harriet, but perhaps she resembled her cousin, Catherine Hardy. She was born in Lisbon and grew up in England, a member of the aspiring gentry, educated at an elite boarding school. Her mother's grandfather and uncle, both Sir Charles Hardys, were admirals. 
and her uncle served as governors of New York and New Jersey. In 1776, she met John O'Connor, an Irish law student in London. He appeared to be a gentleman, albeit poor, with unverified hints of connections to ancient Irish royal families. That is what the name O'Connor signified. John was educated during a period where the penal laws that had oppressed Irish Catholics were being released, and their own mixed religious marriage speaks to their belief in the trajectory of political reform. After becoming a barrister in Dublin, the couple returned to London in the early 1780s. Eliza Harriet's father died, leaving her the modest income from a trust independent of her husband's control. They came of age in the 1770s and 1780s, the age of the Constitution. As I've noted, Constitution here meant a framework of government, not a piece of paper. And people were rethinking assumptions about who should participate in the state. For women, for some women, reform raised the possibility of altering an intellectual tradition that had embraced female inferiority. As far back as Aristotle, the Western tradition had embraced this ideology. Thus, influential educational theorist Rousseau explained, the whole education of women ought to be relative to men. I appeal to yourself, be sincere. Which would you esteem the most? A woman who you found employed in the proper occupations of her sex, in her domestic concerns? or a female genius, scribbling verses and surrounded by pamphlets of all sorts. A radical new idea arose in the English-speaking world, female genius, which signified that women had equal capacity, deserved an equal education, and political representation. Recognition of female genius in this period included, to take just a few examples, the nine muses of Britain painted showing contemporary female geniuses as proof of Britain's golden age. African-American poet Phyllis Wheatley was called a female genius. And Catherine Macaulay, the great English constitutional historian, was painted wearing the Roman senatorial sash. In London, female debating societies debated female representation. And you can see the newspapers published the debate topics. Ought not the women of Great Britain to have a voice in the election of representatives and be eligible to sit in Parliament as well as men, 1780. The Duchess of Devonshire in 1780 became well known for political activities. And on this side of the Atlantic, in front of George Washington and Congress in 1783, the Princeton graduate Edmund Snowden, who gave the oratorical graduating address, titled his address on female education and argued, there are none of the learned and important employments of life which the female mind has not proved itself able to comprehend and direct. Now in 1770, 1786, Eliza Harriet and John moved to New York, the capital of the United States, beginning an eight-year journey that would find her lecturing and opening academies throughout the United States. She began and ended her career with Columbia's. In New York, her first school emphasized the art of reading, what we would think of as political oratory, French, history, math, writing, and needlework. And her female schools, extraordinary public exams, were held at Columbia College with the participation of Columbia professors, and then she wrote a review of her students' paper, uh, performance in the paper. But although Eliza Harriet was successful in New York in a pattern that would repeat itself because of coverture, which meant that married women had to follow their husbands, John's career decisions altered hers. He was hired as editor for a Philadelphia magazine, and they moved to Philadelphia in early 1787, where a convention was to meet to revise the federal constitution. Philadelphia was diverse and cosmopolitan, the largest city in the United States with approximately 40,000 people, and reform was in the air. The Reverend Absalom Jones and the formerly enslaved Richard Allen 
formed the Free African Society to support the free blacks population. The Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery reorganized and printed its constitution in the newspaper. And reform interested a remarkable group of elite Philadelphia women, Franklin's daughter, Sarah Frank Bache, Eliza Willing Powell, the woman who would trigger the quote, a republic if you can keep it, and later urged George Washington successfully not to resign. As Constitutional Convention delegates gathered in 1787, Eliza Harriet gave the first public lecture by a woman in the United States. Beginning Monday, April 2nd, 1787, in every Philadelphia newspaper, Eliza Harriet's ads appeared for a course of lectures at the university. She gave her lectures in University Hall, the location of male lecturers. And her lecturers promoted Enlightenment Bell Letters rhetoric, the foundation for professions like politics. She gave at least five lectures in April, Maine, and June, with selections from Milton, Shakespeare, and Pope, political reformers like James Thompson, Edward Young, and William Shenstone, who we don't remember, but were big deals then, and the influential political reformer, William Jones, one of the first people to actually uh, argue in some ways for a Second Amendment style right to bear arms. Women were represented as authors. She included always a work by Madame de Genlis, who was the first woman tutor to the French royal family, and as subjects. Now, how unusual was Eliza Harriet's lecturing? Well, there are literally no images of women lecturing in public at this period. The closest model, model was an ancient one, the story of Hortensia, of which there are numerous illuminated manuscripts. Hortensia gave a speech in Rome arguing about whether women should be required to pay taxes since they weren't formally represented. And the Hortensia, this is from Boccaccio's famous book on famous women. And the triumvirs, the men who are listening to her, are always portrayed like this. One person li listening, interestingly, one person looking bored, and one person asleep. So this is the classic way that men are, uh, are theorized to relate to women. What was the significance of her speeches? Well, she wrote herself in the newspaper about this. She wrote a newspaper column anonymously that praised the lady lecturer herself and her effort to cultivate the human mind, as she put it. She wrote she was an example that in the new United States, the ladies were found in the society of the sages of the other sex. They would command the honors of professors of science. And she predicted soon the toilette and the drawing room, those were the two traditional venues for women, would be deserted for the forum and the college. Her lectures were designed to encourage women to enter college education and the forum politics. Indeed, she gave the prayer on Demosthenes from the Oration of the Crown the single most famous political speech. All told, there are over 140 ads or commentary about her in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. And Washington's presence at her May 18th lecture led to accounts of her lecturing to be reprinted across the United States. Indeed, Eliza Harriet delayed her lecture one day to ensure that through Washington's presence, her message would be amplified. She basically used him to send her message viral. Her lecturing, his presence, and the convention became bound together. In early June 1787, she revealed a more ambitious plan, a female academy of belles lettres, governing board, half women, run by a woman, majority rule by women, lecturing publicly to 300 people. And it's in this advertisement that she explained that the exertions of a female, the work of a woman, should be an example to be imitated and proved on. She wanted to be an example, but not the exceptional example that so often had been perversely used to show most other women's inferiority, but as an example to be emulated, to inspire other women, to be improved on. She sent her plan to Benjamin Franklin's daughter, Sarah Franklin Bache. 
And I believe this example of Eliza Harriet giving lectures proposing a female higher education academy, predicting that American women would be in the college and the forum, influenced the Constitution's stylistic phrasing of offices. In state constitutions prior to 1787, we find political participants described in different ways. Some are neutral, person or inhabitant. Some are generic in the 18th century sense, using the word he. And a very, very small number are gender specific, using the word male. The first draft of the Constitution included gender specific language. Congress was actually two separate and distinct bodies of men. The pernicious three-fifths clause referred to inhabitants of every sex. And then most importantly, the draft fugitive slave clause emphasized that, I think I missed a slide here, whoops, okay. Yeah, here we go, sorry, these are out of order. The, um, the draft fugitive slave clause emphasized that men and women, he or she escaping to free states would be returned to slavery. And this inclusion of she, the one she in the entire drafting documents is a testament to black women's agency, someone like Oni Judge who escaped. The delegate who proposed the language enslaving could not bring that idea to mind without explicitly thinking of women. But the final drafting committee removed every gendered reference. And these changes created a neutral constitution with a consistent person-he pattern. Persons referred to inhabitants of every sex, and he was used as a generic pronoun. We know that person-he has to be interpreted this way because the interstate rendition clause, which allows, which requires states to give back people who escape um, across state lines, uses this same language. Never once did the word male appear. The text of the Constitution left open and unanswered what would be the relationship of women to the constitutional state. It left itself open to the possibility of female genius. But for others, female genius proved threatening. Enter Benjamin Rush. He had a remarkable mind. He was anti-slavery. He was involved in various reformist enterprises. He had married Julia Stockton when she was 17, and they had 13 children. At the time of Eliza Harriet's lectures, Rush served on the all-male board of a newly reorganized female school, the Young Ladies Academy. These men wanted to reform female education, but only as long as they were in charge. In late July, Rush gave a widely reprinted speech Thoughts Upon Female Education. It was designed to destroy Eliza Harriet and her plan. He took the old female inferiority argument and he gave it a new American twist, what historians later became calling Republican motherhood. Gentlemen would direct female education. British ideas were un-American. French should not be taught. Young ladies should be educated to be, as he put it, an agreeable companion for a sensible man and the daughter or wife of an American citizen. And in thinking about what that meant, directed to Eliza Harriet O'Connor and John O'Connor, whose last name signified them as Irish, one can hear the nativism. At Rush's Young Ladies Academies for years to follow, and, and this is what this image is here, the girls' notebooks reminded on the cover what they were there for. And that says, the end of a good education, this is on the girls' notebooks at the Young Ladies Academy, the end of an education is not that they should become dancers, singers, players, or painters. Its real object is to make them good daughters, good wives, good mistresses, good members of society, good Christians. Eliza Harriet stood no chance. Russia's opposition doomed Eliza Harriet's Academy, and she moved first to Baltimore, where she offered lectures on the compass of the human mind. Her tickets were sold by Mary Catherine Goddard, who was the first person to print the Declaration of Independence with the signer's names and her own. And that's what we see here. This is her own printing of her name. And then she moved on to Alexandria, where she started a female school, which Washington supported. And when her husband moved on to Edenton, she got herself invited to Mount Vernon to consult with George and Martha Washington about her future. 
She eventually moved to Charleston in 1790 to found a female academy. And perhaps because of connections made when her husband, when her father briefly served there in the 1760s, and undoubtedly because of the socioeconomic advantages of whiteness in a city built on slavery, her Charleston school flourished. Her curriculum included science, astronomy, geography, and she may have crossed paths with Washington when he came south for the southern tour. Eliza Harriet was not alone in her view that women were equal to men and that education, public speaking, and political participation were linked. Female education was political. It proved that women were equal to men. And we can see this linking in the far more um, famous Mary Wollstonecraft. In 1787, Mary Wollstonecraft published Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. The historian Catherine McCauley at the same time also published a book on female education assuming female equality. Now female education emphasized public speaking and reading aloud, and so in 1789, Wollstonecraft published anonymously The Female Reader, which contained selections by which women and schoolgirls could learn to read out loud. The art of reading became a device by which young women could invade public spaces under the guise of doing oratory. And then in January 1792, she published Rights of Women, positively initially as received in the United States. And this illustration down here um, is, the, uh, let's see, is the illustration to volume one of the Philadelphia Ladies Magazine, which excerpted considerable sections from Rights of Woman, and it represents the genius of the magazine and the genius of emulation, of imitation, presenting liberty with the rights of women. Wollstonecraft lamented that women have not a road open by which they can pursue more extensive plans of usefulness and independence. And what she means by independence is a life which did not require you to be married to be economically supported. Eliza Harriet could not have said it better. And Wollstonecraft then in the next sentence writes, I may excite laughter by dropping a hint which I mean to pursue, for I really think women ought to have representatives instead of being arbitrarily governed without having any share allowed them in the deliberations of government. And we can now see that exclusion was a, cu a custom, unjust and detrimental. Those words appear in a widely reprinted 1790 newspaper comment. Exclusion was a custom, it was not legally required. Women, according to the comment should not be obliged to submit to laws they have no share of making. It was unjust and detrimental. They wrote, women are equal to the males. And indeed, this custom of exclusion did not exist everywhere. Women and people of color vote in New Jersey under a 1776 state constitution that stated that all inhabitants could vote if they were worth 50 pounds. In 1790, legislation explicitly used he or she to describe who was eligible to vote, and 17, seven years later, another law referred to his or her ballot. Extant poll lists show many women voters, indeed a critic in the early 1800s, complained that over 10,000 women had voted, and that includes people of color. In 1793, at Young Ladies Academy, Russia's old institution, the young graduate, Priscilla Mason, who could have heard Eliza Harriet speak six years later, gave a speech which has become a key primary secondary school source text. Mason protested limits on women. Supposing now that we possessed all the talents of an orator in the highest perfection, where shall we find a theater for the display of them? The church, the bar, the senate are shut against them, against us. And who shut them? Man, despotic man, first made us incapable of the duty and then forbid us the exercise. Let us by suitable education qualify ourselves for those high departments they will open before us. The trajectory was clear, education, oratory, and the doors of the Senate and the bar would open. But this vision and Eliza Harriet's collapsed. In the spring of 1792, a large financial crisis rocked the United States. 
In Charleston, Eliza Harriet's husband found himself caught in financial crisis and brought her down with him. She published an ad to excuse the interruption in her business, her school, inevitably produced by the disorder in Mr. O'Connor's pecuniary engagements, that means financial matters. And they left, fleeing across state lines, fleeing their debt. And so, too, the vision promoted by Eliza Harriet, Wollstonecraft, and others collapsed after 1792. There's a variety of explanations, but they result in what the political historian Rosemary Zagari calls a backlash against women's inclusion in the constitutional state. Indeed, the new genre of the written constitution converted custom to very sticky constitutional law. As new states entered the Union, voter requirements shifted. In 1792, Kentucky broadened suffrage for white men. It became the first Western state to permit men to vote without a property or tax paying requirement. But it did so by describing voters as free male citizens. And this language resembled the Federal Militia Act of 1792, which stated every free, able-bodied white male citizen was to enroll and drew on some southern constitutions. By 1799, Kentucky had excluded free people of color from voting or bearing arms. By 1802, the Kentucky model proved dominant. Every state admitted to the Union between 1802 and 1876 now defined suffrage by constitutional exclusion. These laws or constitutional provisions began with an adjective, free or white, and after 1820, almost always white. And they ended with a description, person, inhabitant, citizen. But what never varied was the new inclusion of the word male. Indeed, in 1807, New Jersey reversed course and passed a new law limiting voting to free white male citizens. By the 19th century, greater participation government had occurred. In 1840, in theory, more than 90% of white men could vote, but at a great cost. Like people of color, women found themselves constitutionally excluded now because they were not white males. What historians used to call the rise of democracy in the 1820s is something that does not look, to my mind, very much like democracy. Eliza Harriet's life followed this decline. In 1793, she moved to Columbia, where she started a female seminary devoted to improving the female mind. John vanishes completely. I could find no record of him. She maintained her ambition, and despite in this last ad describing her feeble attempts at teaching, she proposed an evening school to teach French. When she died in 1811, she was a boarder in someone else's house. But she exerted control over her property, writing a will, signing her name. Her inventory recorded her books, her spectacles, her sewing materials. I could find no gravestone. What influence did she have? Well, we don't know precisely, but recall her own words. The exertion of a female should be considered as presenting an example, to be imitated and improved on. And if we look carefully, we see examples of women following the path that Eliza Harriet tried to open, each imitated and improved on by the next woman. Black women rights activists, like the famous Philadelphia Fortin sisters, were educated often at female academies, and they grew comfortable as public lecturers, and they often tried teaching. For them, education and the vote were bound together. Indeed, the first woman to vote under unrestricted suffrage was Utah school teacher Sarah F. Young in 1870, and the first black woman to register to vote in 1871, Mary Ann Shad Carey, was an African-American teacher, later lawyer. So return for a moment to Columbia, South Carolina, the place where Eliza Harriet died. In 1869, the South Carolina legislature invited any lady to give a speech arguing for women's rights to vote. Only one lady, Charlotte Rollin, accepted. Rollin was a South Carolina black woman, educated much like Eliza Harriet. She was fluent in French and Bell letters. And her speech argued 
for black women and all women to claim the franchise. She argued it was a fundamental and constitutional right belonging, as she put it, to humanity in general. The New York Times noticed and mocked her argument, which they explained was, well, because the Constitution does not include the word male, sex is unknown to the Constitution and women had the right to vote. Rollin ignored the mockery and managed to make sure that her speech was printed. And so copies survive today. And she continued to work throughout her life with women's suffrage associations, arguing for the right of representation. In May 1787, George Washington heard Eliza Harriet deliver a lecture on the power of being an example. And in the 1780s, the age of the Constitution rearranged assumptions about who constituted the state. Female genius became a rebuttal to alleged female inferiority, and the Constitution, importantly, was stylistically framed consistent with female genius. But this example often also inspired opposition, particularly male opposition, and in the 1790s, as female genius became the rights of woman, opposition took the new constitutional state and converted it to one defined by exclusion. But who knows what ripples went forth from her lectures, her schools, and her many newspaper ads. As an early example of the path from female education towards the college and the forum, Eliza Harriet, first female public lecturer in the United States, gave a performance that was certainly more than tolerable. Thank you very much. Anyone have a question? I, I, I just am happy to answer any question, so it doesn't have to be like a significant question. It can just be a question. This is the, I'll just, while people are thinking of a question and some people are leaving, I'll tell you. So um, this is a postcard that was done um, for, well, they used to, Washington's birthday used to have postcards done for it. And this is, did I save my country for this? And uh, you can see the votes for women on the left side, um, uh, and Washington is on the right side. And the same illustrator did another one in which Lady Liberty is shaking her finger at George Washington and uh, with a similar caption. And that's what I actually wanted as the cover of my book. Um, and then they were like, yeah, it's too edgy. And so I ended up with, um, with the cover that, uh, that you see, very patriotic looking cover. But I was secretly hoping for the kind of edgier patriotic cover. But, um, but the press is always get to make the final call. Yeah, Dr. Allen. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to wait for you to get a mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was told I was not to answer a question Thank until you. they Thanks, had the Lauren. mic. Uh, my question actually gets towards the latter part of your talk. Um, I'm curious whether you've made this discovery of somebody who's basically been lost to time, or was it the case that some of the more familiar latter 19th century suffragettes uh, that we know of, uh, in fact, did know about Eliza Harriet, and, and did you find any references uh, to them um, late 19th century, early 20th century? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I didn't find references to, um, uh, to Eliza Harriet, but the early, the people who are active in the women's rights movement before the Civil War, and uh, right about the time of the 14th Amendment, are um, the people who push very hard and recover the fact that women vote in New Jersey. And they feel that this is an important lost aspect of American history, and they try and 
make the argument they are ultimately unsuccessful that what the new jersey voting shows is that you don't need to rian you don't need to enfranchise women because women were sort of enfranchised in the in the beginning and in some ways the language of the 19th amendment when it comes into the constitution um actually says that because the language of the 19th amendment actually says the states cannot disenfranchise so it's based on an assumption that the that the constitution itself um uh enfranchised and um and this the fact that women vote in new jersey is become a very important aspect of um the interpretation of sort of political party and political constitutional development and the museum of the american revolution now uh, and the National Constitution Center both have pretty great exhibits on um, uh, New Jersey women voting and what does that tell us. It also includes people of, um, of people of color voting. And one of the things that the National, that the Museum of the American Revolution is doing is they're going through the, you know, you only know that because people didn't happen to throw away the poll lists. People signed their name in. Um, uh, anonymous voting is a relatively recent invention. Um, and so there's these poll lists of people signing when they showed up to vote. And the Museum of the American Revolution has a project that's going through a lot of those voter lists and trying to figure out, because newspaper articles suggest that some of the people who vote are married women, even though you would think that they couldn't, and so that's one of the questions that people are super interested in. But I would have loved to have found something about Eliza Harriet, but unfortunately, she was very transitory and moved around a lot. Uh, hello, this is... So my question is based on, um, in one of my history classes last semester, we read a book called The Woman's Hour, which is about the 19th century fight, 19th Amendment um, fight in Tennessee specifically. And um, one of the important, or the interesting things in that book that I really liked was the, or I found interesting, was the argument that um, a lot of anti-suffragists use on Southern womanhood. And so with your talk on um, like women in New Jersey initially having um, the right to vote, um, but then later getting revoked in the um, American custom. I was wondering if through your research you had any, um, or you encountered anything about like regional differences in the perception of women in this area. Yeah, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great um, question about the 19th Amendment and where you see opposition. And, um, uh, you know, there is opposition in the South. Um, Massachusetts violently opposes um, uh, women's suffrage. And, um, uh, you know, women don't serve on juries in Massachusetts until the 1950s. They're barred from juries. So there's a way in which um, there is that regional story, but there's also a story that escapes the kind of um, uh, regional piece. And in, in the South, one of the things that's interesting um, is there are a, a couple now pretty, pretty well known, I think, among historians, examples where um, white women related to uh, male political participants wrote letters like, I think I should be able to participate and vote. And, that's, and that tells you something about how it's often people who are in um, relation to people who have uh, political power. You know, the, the complicated story in the 19th century after the 14th and 15th Amendment then um, you know, that becomes a much more complicated story about state sovereignty and things like that. And of course, uh, in terms of the states that were quickest to embrace women's suffrage uh, and ratification, it was the West, uh, and particularly Utah, where um, uh, uh, Utah and um, uh, the church, um, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, were very interested in allowing women to vote, and they were some of the um, significant women's activists. So one of the things that's so interesting about the story is um, the themes are the same in some ways, but people who make them are very different. But yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Thank you for your um, lecture. I thought it was very interesting. Um, my question is, reading other books about, you know, the, the so-called founding mothers, um, for example, Woody Holton's biography of Abigail Adams, uh, they focus on the influence that the wives and family members of the founders, the founding fathers had on the Constitution. Why is it so important that um, these women were uh, expressing their ideas in a public forum? Yeah, it's a great question. So 
the, the classic interpretation that really develops out of Russia's speech and the foundational text that was actually originally used by women's historians to try and claim some space was Russia's speech. And Russia's speech is the text that uh, both Linda Kerber and Mary Beth Norton originally used in the 1780s to try and argue women were involved. But, but that's because we lost the other voice. So that speech is a middle ground voice. And it was an important voice and it was a voice that, you know, I, that you can find women who believed in that voice, who believe very much that at home, in the private realm, as you point out, that that influence was important. And that, and that was, uh, there's a whole theory about what's called the Republican court, that as um, the new government uh, grew, women played an important role through salon culture, uh, through private um, uh, functions in influencing government. That is not the same as in public, taking up public space, which is, an, which is fundamentally an argument about insisting that, that women have the same capacity as men. And I, I, for me, this is um, really striking because, because certainly for years in my lifetime, um, I had no female professors. I went to law school, there were very few female professors. Um, and the way in which even today, what role you have in a public stage as a woman, um, I think is very different than, than you know, we tend to think in terms of men. And so uh, what's so interesting is that a lot of the early women's rights activists come out of religious traditions where women speaking in public was accepted. And so a, a good example of this were um, uh, in the 1840s and 18, 1830s and 40s, in the early efforts around Seneca Falls, many of those leading women came out of um, the Quaker faith. And they had been used to, and, and other women suffrage uh, activists in that period are like, we were scared to talk, but they had had practice of talking um, in front of men. But even at the Seneca Falls Declaration, you know, we usually put the Seneca Falls Declaration out by itself. But if you include the introduction to that, it says, here's the, you know, this is the great document where women are going to use the Declaration of Independence to argue that they deserve rights. And the very beginning says, none of us had ever been used to chairing a meeting. And so we elected a nice man to chair the meeting. Okay? And that tells us something very important about, um, uh, about practice and public practice. And I, I do think I'm a person, you wouldn't know this when I'm standing up here, I'm literally sick to my stomach speaking out loud. And um, one of the things that really I found happened to me in working on this project was realizing the importance of speaking aloud even when I felt uncomfortable in doing that. And, and I do think this is something that, um, you know, particularly women who often feel like uh, uh, there will be significant costs if they get up and speak. I, I really think people should hold their breath and take all those opportunities to do it because I do think speaking in a public space is different than speaking even powerfully in a, in a private space. So a great, a great question. I think we're at the, at the witching hour here. I, think we are. I always feel like I, because everybody's always so courteous and is like, oh, we wouldn't want to call it, but I always feel like the speaker's job is to be like, it is time to end on time. Thank you. Thank you. You sounded fascinating. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.